Okay, so it just passed uh, 4 p.m. Um, in the Pacific time. Um, good, good evening or good morning. I'm Takahide Akiyama, Japan Society of Northern California. Welcome to today's event on the Japanese traditional art of no. Um, we had, uh, this is, this is a, a part of traditional arts in modern Japan series. We had, uh, some of you attended, I'm sure, um, Kabuki event last year, and that was very popular. And we um, at the Japan Society, uh, we uh, recognize, uh, confirmed that the Japanese traditional culture, art, uh, still very popular, not only among the Japanese people, but among also non-Japanese people. So we decided to um, continue to offer Japanese traditional arts series as a series. So we are, we, are, we are here today with no. We are very fortunate to have uh, Professor Emmert with us uh, today, who was fascinated uh, by the beauty of no when he visited uh, Japan over 40 years ago, and uh, subsequently became a master and teacher of no, as well as, I would say, an ambassador of no to the world. As you know, in 2001, No Gaku, which includes No and Kyogen, was proclaimed as masterpiece of the oral and intangible heritage of humanity by UNESCO. And in 2008, it was inscribed on the UNESCO representative list of the intangible culture, cultural heritage of humanity. This is a testament of, that the No is internationally recognized for its value as a performing art, which has lasted over 600 years. Richard is going to tell us about all important uh, elements of No and show us how they are performed. Under the COVID-19 situation uh, restrictions, um, he has kindly uh, took time for this particular event to go to a studio to pre-record some of the elements um, that uh, he finds more difficult to show, share with you in his uh, home. So he'll be showing, uh, combining his live talk and the presentations with some short videos so that we can learn and enjoy know fully. Richard, thank you very much for your extra efforts. For us. Okay. With that, a further ado, I would like to welcome Re Professor Emmett, a rare American no master. Richard, over to you. Fine. Thank you very much. Um, it's difficult, as it, I'm sure many people have already experienced how difficult it is to uh, speak on Zoom, uh, but I'm sure by this time many of you have already had that. Uh, opportunity to do so. Um, I'm coming to you from my home in Tokyo. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have the uh, space that it looks like behind me. Uh, I wish I had this stage. This is a no stage from here in Tokyo, of the Kita School that's in Meguro, uh, Tokyo, for those of you who have visited Tokyo. Um, and uh, the Kita School is one of the five major schools uh, of no, that is the stylistic schools of no. And uh, uh, that's the one that I belong to. Uh, but uh, today in our limited time, I wish to um, introduce to you various aspects of no. Uh, there is so much that I could talk about. Um, I do want to mention briefly for some of you who don't know anything about it. Well, I'm sure some of you might even know quite a lot about it. And uh, you can certainly question me about anything I say about it in that regard. But um, one thing to keep in mind is that, particularly for some of you who might have seen the Kabuki, is that Kabuki is from the Edo period. And so the roots of, I mean, the distant roots uh, are perhaps older, but, but Kabuki itself began more around 16, in the 1600s and developed into the 1700s and carried over and has developed 
through the Edo period. No is one um, layer or, well, several layers perhaps older than that. And so we generally think of No as uh, the people who brought No into its present form uh, from around the 1300s of, of Kanami and then his son Zayami. And so Zayami is particularly well known as, as perhaps the uh, uh, one person that's dubbed him the Shakespeare of Japan in that he uh, wrote about No, about how No should be performed. And then he of course was a performer he also wrote a number of no plays. And, uh, and actually to the degree that when I first came to Japan in the 70s, uh, you could look up uh, in any of the chant books that you would get, there'd be background saying that this is another play written by Zayami. Uh, in fact, uh, any play where they didn't know who actually wrote it, they often would just say, it must have been written by Zayami because he was that important a person. Actually, scholars since that time have, found, have decided that there are a number of plays that they have no proof that written by Zayami, but still uh, perhaps around 60 plays. And this is around the 240, which are considered the, um, the number of the classical no uh, uh, performances that were in the classical repertory. Of, of no. And so that history is something that is quite old, uh, generally so 600 to 650 years um, ago when Zayami was born. Um, but then there are many other things we could talk about today and that has to do with types of plays or, or how characters are structured in plays. Um, I do hope to talk about, uh, show you some of the masks that are used and talk about the movement uh, and how movement takes place. And I'll show a video for that. Uh, also talk about the music because the music is also very important in, uh, in any aspect of the performance of No. Um, and then costumes as well. One thing that I should point out, and you may hear, um, there's a street right in front of my house. So you may hear some traffic going by from time to time. But um, uh, one thing I do want to point out that unlike Kabuki, which has a lot of, uh, in fact, it's stylistic, but almost realistic. Uh, many aspects of it are quite realistic, a lot of makeup and all. No doesn't use makeup. It uses masks generally just for the main characters. And uh, so, uh, and it's also done on a very small stage. So you can see perhaps a little bit behind me that the stage is, is actually quite small. There's a bridgeway that would be off to the side. Uh, and, and you can see that, I guess it would be off to this side. And that bridgeway uh, would, uh, is a little bit longer, even longer than the size of the stage, but most of the activity of, of the performance takes place on the stage. And unlike Kabuki with its many performers, uh, or I should say many characters, uh, No often has much uh, a, a, a fewer number of, of performance, generally a main actor, a kind of a secondary actor, and then sometimes, a couple of other actors would be involved as well. So um, uh, that is something uh, that, that we can talk about as we go along because there are many differences from Kabuki. And uh, those of you who saw the presentation on Kabuki before um, will certainly notice some of those differences. But I would like to start our uh, today off by showing about a five and a half minute clip of a very well-known play, Funabenke. And so it is one of the most important uh, of the plays that uh, exists in, in uh, No, and uh, one of the most popular, I should say, as well. And this is the final part of it. And so Miho, would you start that and we'll just go back to it. Oh, <laughs> 
Porque mi hijo. Let's stop. Recording then. Good. Um, this is just to give you a brief idea of uh, what no looks like on stage. Uh, some of you <clears throat> already may have the idea that, of course, no is very, very slow. And uh, that's an image that exists because, in fact, uh, a lot of no is very slow. This is the very end of the play, play Zunabenke. And so there is a kind of a buildup to this very end where the first half of the play is, in fact, quite different from, from that. But we're in our limited time. I thought I would show you the more exciting part of this particular play. Um, uh, and the clip that I just showed you is actually on YouTube. And if you put Funabenke in, uh, it's a fairly recent post on YouTube. There are probably a number of Funabenke uh, uh, versions that will come up on YouTube. Uh, but this is one that I think is really quite good in its whole introduction. It's by a Kita school uh, performer. And uh, so if you get a chance, uh, please take a look. And it does have the English at the bottom. And so you could see the actual whole play. And uh, the introduction that he gives to it is a kind of introduction to know in the time of COVID. And so that too is quite interesting. Now, next, I would like to talk about uh, the music of No. And you could hear uh, the instruments playing, and I'll talk about the instruments separately, but you could also hear both the voice of the, uh, of the actor and then the voice of the chorus that would be seated as we're facing the stage off to the right side. And um, so uh, the chorus and how they sing or any individual actors and how they sing, this sort of singing or perhaps chanting is the more uh, typical uh, terminology uh, can be divided into three different styles. And the first style I'm going to, this is one thing I can uh, demonstrate here at home. And so that's what I'm going to do. Uh, the first style is um, more what we call wagin or a melodic singing style, which is in some ways closer to what we normally think of as song. And that is to say song has pitch and uh, it varies in pitch. Of course, the support for it is quite strong. And so the chant quality of uh, this sort of very powerful voice is uh, a part of it. And uh, it's not a sort of a, um, such a soft singing style, but it still can be a very strong style, but it is pitch centered. So I'm going to give you an example of that. And this is actually from the first half of Funabenke. And so I'm just going to sing several lines here. Ko ko oru tame shi mo wa di ake no Tsuki no miyako wo udisute te Saikai no hato wo ni i omomuki i so I'll just sing that much for right now, but you can see from that or hear from that, that there are uh, clearly different pitches that are there. Now I make this distinction because the other uh, style, and in fact, what you were hearing in Funabenke was, uh, was a much stronger and less pitch oriented kind of style of singing. And I'm going to just give you a little bit of an example of that. This is called Gogin, or we, in talking about it in English, we talk about it as dynamic style, as opposed to the melodic style. 
And so it would go something like this. You can hear from that that there's a little bit um, less of a pitch orientation. And oftentimes people in teaching that uh, will try and just sing it and grab a pitch and they sound something like sono and just sort of sing it on one flat pitch. But I hope you could tell from my voice that there was a lot more kind of movement in it, but uh, almost perhaps the way we talk, there is pitch in our, in our own speech. Uh, and there's movement in it, but it's hard to often imitate it at that same pitch. Um, and particularly if you're thinking of it as song as instead of chant. But uh, uh, that's sort of difficult to, to uh, ex describe in a short period of time, uh, but just so you know that there's a difference there. But there is also something called kotoba, and kotoba, for those of you who know Japanese, know that this means words. But here, we generally think of it as stylistic speech. And so there is a dialogue between characters um, at times, and they mix, mix in a uh, chant. But the stylistic speech of it is something like this. Kyo no shura no. Kotaki wa taso Nani no tono kami Nori tsune to ya O Ramono mono shi Tenami wa shidinu You can get a sense of how there's a rise and fall in it, in a, a particular phrase. Um, this is from something I will uh, uh, demonstrate in a video uh, in just a little bit, but I do want to point out how this rise and fall can vary depending on the kind of character it is. For example, a female character, an old man, for example, they would have different texts, but I'm going to use the same text to give an idea how that same um, voice can be a little bit softer and not quite such a dramatic rise and fall. Just to give you just a kind of a brief idea how uh, the sort of more dramatic uh, use of kotoba can be done in one way. And of course, guagin and gogin can both be, both of them can be very strong and actually both of them can be a little bit quieter in the way they are done. So those musical aspects are in terms of the chant uh, is first very important. Unfortunately today, I'm not going to go into the rhythms and their relationship between the drums and the chant. We're not going to be able to do that. But next, I would like to introduce uh, the movement of uh, what goes on in No. And this will be from a video. And I'm going to talk uh, from the video uh, about it. And so, Miho, go ahead and start the video on movement. In talking about the movement of No, first thing to be aware of is what is known as kamai, or the basic posture in no. I now am standing essentially in the basic posture of no. You can see that my feet are just slightly apart at the bottom, and my heels are more or less together. And, uh, and one thing, it's a little difficult to sing that way, but you can see more from this angle that 
I am pushing in at the bottom part, the lower back, sort of pushing in and in a sense my upper torso is forward as I'm not so much leaning forward as pushing in so the upper torso is forward in front of, of uh, the lower torso. And you'll even see that my face is in front of my feet. But that is the basic posture for, from which uh, other movement is generated. Uh, that, that kamai, depending on the play, can be a little bit wider or even considerably wider depending on the play. Obviously, the wider you get, it's a much stronger posture that you have uh, as you're facing, and then the movement from that, generated from that, will also be stronger. But let's just stay with the, this most um, sort of typical starting posture. And from this now, um, uh, we also do sudiyashi. Sudiyashi is literally sliding feet. Another word sometimes is hakobi, or how one moves forward. And uh, I generally talk about it as sudiyashi. Sudiyashi is sliding the feet in such a way that at the end of a step, you lift up just very lightly at the end of the step. And for the most part, your whole foot is uh, on the floor until the very end when you change your, um, your balance, your weight, and you change it to the other foot. So the point is to try and do this without much back and forth movement or up and down, bobbing up and down. Maybe from the side, you can see just a little bit more the foot slides, and I'll, I'll lift up my hakama to show this. The foot slides and then lifts up at the end of the step as the weight changes to the other foot. So this is the way one moves on stage. Now, one can move at different speeds. Uh, there's a tendency to to hold back when you're first beginning, and so your first steps might even be a little slower, but then we have something known as Jo Ha Q. Generally, while you're moving in a straight line, slowly, your, the tempo of your step picks up as you move forward, even in a short space. Obviously, if you're walking on a longer, um, a, a, a longer line uh, that will be more obvious perhaps uh, but of course there depending on the play a lot of times you s maintain a pretty pretty slow step but even with that there's a tendency to notice just a little bit of joha q uh, at the, that is to say starting slow picking up speed and ending a little faster but that difference uh, might be very difficult to see in some cases. Other times it's quite obvious. <clears throat> but then, so you have a kamae, and with that you put suryashi. Now, uh, next you have various kata, and uh, this is a term used in a lot of martial arts as well, but, and here in no, we use it to mean movement patterns, and specific patterns that are one sees in a lot of uh, different performances. And any video you would watch, you would see similar kata uh, because they come up in pretty much every play. Um, so one that we use particularly the most often in the Kita school, which I practice, uh, is known as shikake. And generally, uh, you could just have two steps where you go one, two, and all it is is bringing the right hand up and the left hand over to the middle just a little bit. Now, there are some people who might do that in a slightly different way. Uh, sometimes there are some people who just do it with one hand. Um, but 
generally it's this. Now, it doesn't have to be just two steps. It can also be four steps. So that is also what is known as shikake. Shikake means to, to begin something. Um, so this is what is here is four steps or even six steps. All of those are shikake. This same shikake is often followed by another pattern where shikake seems to bring the energy forward. Hiraki brings it back and, in a, and kind of opens it up. So if your energy is going forward, hiraki, right after that, you bring your left foot back a little bit, then the hands come out, maintaining your weight forward. And this is something where I said that the weight forward for the kamai is often or always the case pretty much to in anything, even when you're going backward, you're tending to keep your weight forward. So then you come back into place. So okay, that is, Miho, let's stop the tape at that point. I know it goes on a little bit longer, but we'll stop it there. And uh, just because of time, uh, then a little bit, uh, what I'd like to show next are uh, some brief, what are known as shimai. And that is almost all no plays, a, a play itself might last from an hour to maybe uh, an hour and a half. There are some very long plays that go on for a couple of hours. And oftentimes on a program of no, you might have two no plays plus a kyogen play. Uh, some of the shorter evening programs might be one Kyogen and one No. Uh, longer uh, plays or longer programs that last the whole afternoon might have three plays uh, with one or two Kyogen in between. But also something that is often performed are Shimai sections. And Shimai are short sections from plays. It's, it's, uh, uh, about like singing an aria from an opera and taking it out of the context of the full play, but just doing that particular shimai. So these are actually often done. And they are also often taught to students who are first learning no for the first time. So I do have a couple of uh, shimai that I am doing here. The first one is from the first half of Funabenke and uh, includes the section that I just sung from Funabenke. And so the melody is, it's in the melodic uh, singing style. I'm being helped here by uh, uh, one, he started as my student, I now consider him my colleague, uh, John Ogilvy, who is an American uh, student of No as well. And uh, he has been new, doing No since the uh, mid nineties too. So, uh, and he's based here in Japan. So uh, he is, is singing with me. So let's begin with that. Uh, let's show the, first of all, the Funabenke video, if you can do that, Miho. Thank you. Oh, 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 
Okay, thank you, Miho. I'm going to talk just a little bit before uh, uh, I show the uh, uh, next shimai. Uh, first of all, you can see that a shimai does not use uh, costumes. It just uses this, what's known as monski and a hakama, that's a, a regular kimono, and usually the chorus and the uh, instrumentalists are all just wearing this. And then when you do a shimai, this is just formal dress. And uh, when you do a shimai, uh, this is what is worn. Usually you have uh, like four singers. Uh, unfortunately, I, uh, we only have one, uh, but I wanted to just tell you because uh, in that situation, we don't wear a full uh, costume like you saw in the earlier clip of Funabenke. Now, the uh, next clip is also Shimai. It's called Yashima. And uh, it has, it shows uh, Yoshitsune. And Yoshitsune is involved in Funabenke. But in this play, uh, Yashima, actually Yoshitsune is um, the main character. And so this is the final section. So it is done with a little bit more stronger movement as well as the fact that the singing is all in uh, Gogin style. It begins with the kind of kotaba that I just sang for you, and then it goes into dynamic singing style. So, Miho, can you start that video? <laughs> Thank you, Miho. 
Um, so uh, I hope that gives you a little bit of an idea of uh, some of the movement. Of course, that movement exists in the no, but when it's done in the full uh, context of a no play, uh, the character has a uh, sort of a brilliant costume on, and uh, and that is very much a part of it. But as I said before, the training for no involves doing these dances. And so people first, first training in no learn a lot of different dances. Uh, because those are the more complex aspect and that's how one learns to uh, hold your body in a proper way and uh, how one learns to move about uh, on stage. Now next uh, I'm going to show a video on uh, the instruments. So I also have uh, explanation for that and so uh, Miho would you uh, when you're ready just go ahead and start that video. Next, I would like to introduce the uh, four instruments that are used in the no hayashi, or instrumental ensemble. Um, I have set them out here in the order that you would see them at the back of the stage. Uh, there are three drums and one flute, which of course emphasizes the fact that rhythm becomes very important in no. But first, I'll play the flute. This flute is made of bamboo and has a kind of, uh, traditionally would have a cherry bark that um, is cut around it. And um, uh, the inside of the flute is lacquered. Uh, and uh, it is, it also is very unique because it has a special, uh, what is called a nodo or throat a special extra pipe in the middle, which kind of upsets the acoustical properties one would normally expect with a flute. And that is to say, when you blow lightly on a flute, you would expect in most flutes to get an octave higher. But in the case of a no flute, you don't get an octave higher. For example, which is short an octave. And generally, if you go to other uh, fingerings, Uh, not quite. All of them are kind of off. Now, one would think, uh, well, your melody is going to get all messed up, but that kind of, uh, well, um, difficulty in putting out pitches or having them attuned to more or less a Western style of pitch relationship. Um, is thought to in some way be more appropriate for the otherworldly sort of aspects that uh, exist in no. In any case, I'll play something just very briefly to give you an idea of the sounds. just a very brief idea of the sounds that are used for the no flute. Next is the kotsuzumi. This is one of the two hand drums. This particular hand drum is held at the, sh at the shoulder. So we sometimes call it a shoulder drum, but kotsuzumi literally means small suzumi. Suzumi refers to the fact that it is an hourglass shaped body that it has. This particular, uh, I mean, the kotsuzumi uh, will be different from what I introduce uh, next after this, the otsuzumi, or large uh, uh, hourglass shaped drum, in that this has a more of a softer sound. In that sense, but what is perhaps more important, and I can't give you a lot of it, it, a lot of examples now, but what is most important is the fact that there are drum calls, uh, vocal calls that 
go with the playing of the drum. They are not separate from the drum. They are a part of the drum patterns. Yo, ho, ho. Yo, ho, ho. Ho. That just gives you a very brief idea of the kotsuzuki. Now, all of the various drums have uh, drum calls, and these uh, sort of combine together to keep the rhythm, um, all the various participants together, and instead of having a, a conductor to keep them together, they are kept together largely with the drum calls. And these same drum calls, so they're signals to each other, but they're also signals to members of the chorus, or to uh, any of the roles that are singing at the time. And so they become an important uh, part of it. The drum patterns do, but the drum calls really uh, help uh, anyone who's listening to them, who needs to hear them for signals, as an important part of, of uh, how to keep together with them. Now, uh, next I have an otsuzumi. And here, uh, this is held on the lap. So sometimes people call it either a lap drum or a side drum because it's held off to the side. And uh, I'm not going to play this as hard because in fact, when you play these, uh, you generally put on your fingers uh, these very hard thimbles um, and, and the thimbles uh, protect the fingers because in fact, uh, uh, what happens, and I don't have the ones that quite fit my hands right now, but uh, in any case, these thimbles help protect the fingers when you hit it. Uh, also, there's another uh, aspect which protects the fingers, and that's something that goes on the inside of the palm, generally. This is what most Otsuzumi players play today. There's, there are some who do not use these, in fact, when they play, but the protection is necessary because Yotsuzumi needs to have, um, is generally heated beforehand to make it um, uh, very dry. And so instead of the, the sound that you got from the Kotsuzumi, you get a much um, sort of drier, high pitched sound with Yotsuzumi. And so if you listen to any of the recordings, you'll be able to, to hear that much higher sound. I won't get so much uh, of a sound here because I haven't heated these heads, uh, nor do I have these particular finger protections on right now. But in any case, it would be held at the side and played in, in this particular manner. Yo, ho, ho, yo, ho. So again, using drum calls to, um, to keep all the drums together. And finally, I have the taiko. The taiko is, uh, is just what is known as a, uh, well, this is a barrel shaped drum. So it's not the hourglass shaped drum of the two Suzumi. Uh, and it's put on a stand uh, and instead play with two rather thick sticks. Now, uh, these are different from the taiko that often exists in uh, other places where you have uh, the, because taiko is the general name for any kind of drum. But in no, we refer to this particular drum specifically as a taiko. Uh, we do not have other size drums at all. It's just these three drums where you, but kotsuzumi, yotsuzumi, and taiko are their names. But uh, here we have a, this kind of striking of the drum in this particular manner, or with the drum call, ho, yo, ho, yo, yo, ho, yo, yo. Okay, Mio, we can stop there. Um, 
So I have, that should give you just a brief idea of some of the uh, elements that go into the music of No. Um, next, I'm going to very briefly introduce to you the, um, uh, the masks. And I need to do this, and I'm going to cancel my uh, background here so you can now see the inside of my home. Um, and uh, so with this, it's a little bit easier to uh, introduce the masks. The first one I'm introducing is uh, Komote. It's really uh, perhaps the most uh, well-known of the uh, women masks and generally to represent a young woman of maybe 16 to 18 years of age. And uh, so you can get a little bit of an idea of this mask. There are many other women masks of older women as well, but I'm just showing you. And then on the back, you can see these small little pillows or cushions that are put on the back to adjust to the performer's sort of face. And this uh, kind of makes the angle a proper angle for that. Uh, they're called ate. And, uh, and you can also see how uh, there are uh, mask cords that are attached as well to, to the side. And of course, then this would be put up to the actor's face and tied around, uh, tied around the back of his face. Now, I'm not going to do that for you right now, but instead introduce several different masks. Another the very well-known mask, um, probably because often referred to as anime as well. And this is what's called Hanya. And this is a female demoness, I guess you would say. And this Hanya mask, uh, of course, one of the characteristics is its two horns. I've asked people many times, um, uh, what do you think this is, male or female? And oftentimes people will say, oh, it's male, of course, but it isn't, <laughs> it's female. And uh, strangely enough, the, uh, it's the uh, female um, uh, demons that uh, grow horns. Uh, there are male demons as well, but they tend not to grow horns. Why that is, uh, I don't think I can actually say. <laughs> uh, here's another uh, more typical maybe young man mask. It's known as Kantan Otoko. And uh, there's a well-known play called Kantan uh, about a Chinese uh, young man uh, searching for enlightenment. And so uh, one often talks about these little creases at the brow there uh, that suggest his kind of uh, deep thinking. Uh, and so that's uh, that also, um, exists, but it's also used for a very well-known a god play uh, to portray a young god in Takasago, in the second half of the play Takasago. So I have those masks, but now I want to show you one more mask that I have. And this is one that the company that I found, uh, and, uh, uh, and we have been doing English No now since the early 2000s. Uh, for about 20 years. And this is one of a play that we recently had commissioned. Uh, that is the mask we had commissioned. And uh, I'm not sure if you recognize the character. Once I say it, most people say, ah, yes, that's who it is. Um, this is what we call an Elvis mask. And uh, we presented a, pl a play called uh, Blue Moon Over Memphis. And uh, in the second half particularly, the um, this Elvis mask was used. And one might think that, of course, portraying Elvis in No is very, very different from anything one would expect. Um, and it's certainly not a classical No play, but it does uh, give us just a little bit uh, some of the, uh, I mean, it's very much created like a regular No mask. And uh, the play itself, rather than being uh, it was actually a very sad play in that the spirit of Elvis returns and talks 
a lot about his own loneliness and his loneliness in death. And uh, so uh, without going into too much other detail, I think I better, I mean, one of the things I just mentioned, English no, and uh, uh, our company Theater Nogaku, if you uh, Google us, we have a web page. And uh, we also actually uh, are teaching, particularly since COVID, we are uh, combining with some um, actors over here and teaching uh, students Utai, that is the chant, online. So if any of you want to go to our webpage, see a little bit about some of the activities that we have been doing over the last number of years, uh, you certainly may do so. But I think I better stop my presentation to allow uh, some questions now. I know we've gone over time, but um, I'll take it back to uh, Takahide over there. So thank you. Well, uh, Richard, thank you very much for all those detailed explanation and demonstration. They're all fascinating. Thank you very much. So now we'd like to move on to a Q&A session. And um, we have already uh, many questions uh, for you. But if I may, I would like to ask you uh, to begin with uh, this question. So you mentioned that in the 70s, you went to Japan and um, you encountered no, uh, while you were seeking to, you know, uh, explore more of the Japanese uh, traditional music. I wondered how you could perhaps tell us how you, you know, encountered and then uh, afterwards uh, how you have been fascinated and so your story with no, that may be fascinating. I'm sure that everyone wants to hear your answer. Well, in a, in a short, short... Uh, I'll try and do this short in a few minutes. <laughs> I would like to say that uh, uh, I took a seminar on no at Earlham College in Indiana, uh, where I was an undergraduate. And this was in 1970. And so that was my first introduction. And uh, I should also say about that introduction, the very first time I heard a recording of no, I listened to, we were just a music professor and theater professor were introducing it and the music professor played this recording and I heard the drum calls and quite frankly, I could hardly contain my laughter because I was so surprised. I was very much involved in music, but I was so surprised to hear the drum calls of no. And so little did I know at that time that I would be demonstrating many, many years later, uh, those same drum calls to all of you. Uh, but then I did come to Japan uh, in 1970. And so you get an idea of my age. But, um, and I saw no at that time, but I also really decided I wanted to explore more of uh, no performance. And so, uh, well, not no performance at that time of Japanese traditional music performance. So I came again in 1973 and I met a no actor of the Kita school by chance. I was also studying shakuhachi at the time, and uh, which is a bamboo flute, not connected to no. But um, I started taking lessons uh, then mm -hmm. in no. I was able to get into Tokyo University of Fine Arts and Music. And during that time, I studied about uh, Japanese traditional music and Asian traditional music in general. But I also, uh, was taking lessons in no, and I slowly branched out to um, all the various musical instruments. And so I spent much of the 70s just going to lessons and uh, taking all sorts of lessons. And uh, although I was a student, I think I probably spent more time outside going to individual teachers and studying with the individual teachers all the aspects of no. And uh, it was then in the 80s, then I started, I was asked to write some music for an uh, English no. And uh, after that time, I started doing more connected to English no. So it's hard to say what really has drawn my attention to no and it's kept me there. I think a lot of it is the chance I've had to perform and, and the connections I've been able to make with a lot of the teachers who are teaching uh, 
this classical form and where I really appreciate it as a, um, a very interesting aspect because I always have been very interested in both theater and music, but this is both theater and music, which is very different from my own background in theater and music. And uh, I think that difference has kept me interested and uh, I've sort of been doing it all these years. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, uh, please, uh, I would like to encourage you to use chat uh, function to ask questions or raise uh, hand function, uh, please. Uh, I would like, to, I have um, several questions um, in my hand and I would like to call on, uh, if you don't mind, uh, Jorge um, or Jorge or whatever. I'm sorry if I cannot pronounce your name well. Um, hi. Yeah, George, that's fine. George, yes, I'm yeah. sorry, yes. I was just wondering for um, the aristocratic audiences that originally attended these performances, was it for entertainment or was it a, you know, uh, a ritual or what was their experience when they watched this? Well, that, that's a very good question. Thank you for that. Um, actually, it's not, uh, it's hard to just call it an aristocratic audience because actually no, during the Edo period was the official performing art of the daimyos and the samurai. So it did not have anything to do with the imperial house and that sort of uh, aristocratic side of Japanese society. But it was very much uh, carried on by the various daimyo and various lords throughout Japan that included the Edo shogun would have a number of uh, no performers under them. And many of them also studied uh, no. And if you know anything about Edo period history, there were this Toyotomo Hideyoshi and Tokugawa Ieyasu. And some of these people all performed no. And there's records of them putting together uh, performances of no that were done then within the Imperial Palace at the time, which was in Kyoto, of course. And, uh, and then later on, when uh, the Shogun moved to Edo, um, still throughout Japan and all the various provinces and the daimyo uh, lords that were head of those provinces, uh, many of them uh, had no performers under them and, and then had no performances in sort of a special, um, what should I say, uh, uh, kind of performances or when they needed to do special ceremonies of some sort, uh, no would be part of, a, of something that would be done. A program of no would also be done in that case. Thank you. You have a very nice house. I wanted to add that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, George and uh, Richard, for your uh, reply. I have a couple of uh, questions about uh, the you know, things that you used, you showed us uh, during the presentation. I might combine these two um, to ask you. One is uh, the question, please uh, tell, tell us a little bit more about funds that you used uh, in the yes. movements. And also another is, uh, a little bit more explanation about the structure of the flute. Okay. So, so these are, uh, thank you, Margaret and uh, Mark. Uh, should I just go ahead and yes, uh, talk? Uh, yes. I saw the uh, question about the uh, uh, fans. And so I quickly pulled out, whoops. Uh, this is again, one fan that I, I guess I'll have to, uh, uh, turn off my uh, background in order to actually show it. Um, this is one of the fans that I was using. And uh, this is actually a Shimai fan. So there are some times when this fan is used in a no play, but generally this kind of fan would be used uh, just specifically for a Shimai fan. The chorus members uh, might be using another kind of fan that they don't open up, but they just use. And then in practice, 
uh, a fan like this. This is a Kita style fan that is uh, quite often used in practice. But then for a Shimai performance, one might have uh, this fan. This particular one is used for these, what are known as Shura or Warrior No plays. And so Yashima, the one that I did, the second fan that I, uh, or second Shimai that I performed, I was using this particular fan. Um, and so that has uh, generally in this one, this is uh, the sun sink, sinking into the ocean. And that is to suggest the uh, uh, Heike clan in which they were losing um, in the uh, Genpei, that is the Genji and Heike civil wars of the late 1100s. And so there's that, although on the reverse is the opposite. And that is uh, the sun rising is what the idea is. And this is supposed to be the Genji clan, which was victorious in that. Um, uh, I have other particular fans. I have used different kinds of fans. This is more used in, uh, I think I use this in Kunabenke. And uh, you can see it has uh, both uh, cherry blossoms and uh, this particular one <clears throat> has a kind of a carriage in it as well too. And so it could be used for other kind of shimai. And that's a little bit different from a performance uh, for a full no performance fan, which is a little bit different in that it doesn't close all the way. It's made in a slightly different way. It won't close up quite this way. And unfortunately, I don't have an example of that readily available for me. So uh, yes, the fans, or Shimai fans, there are just many, 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 and uh, other people use similar ones to this or uh, slightly different ones. But certainly the second fan is one used, particularly I would say for uh, female characters. Uh, you can see on the reverse side, it's more like a number of different kinds of flowers. Um, but I think on this first side, you have both chrysanthemum and uh, cherry blossoms and uh, probably some other things that I don't entirely know myself. But uh, so that gives you a little bit of an idea of the fans. Um, now, the second question was about the no flute. I'm going to quickly go around to the other side. And uh, yes, I, uh, I do have a no flute here and the same flute that I demonstrated. Uh, I'm not sure if I should play it. Uh, I'm, I'm sometimes a little afraid of what might happen, but it was a little difficult to see in that. But the one thing that's kind of interesting is that this special little pipe on the inside of the flute right here, that is to say, um, generally when the bamboo or when the flute is made, the bamboo is cut approximately right there. This is opened up and a separate pipe is put in. And that kind of, as I said, upsets the acoustical properties of the flute. Um, and so there's another flute. Uh, I have one upstairs at my house, so I won't be able to run and get it. But an, another flute, which is called a ryuteki, uh, which is used in, in gagaku, which is court music. And so obviously the no flute came from that much older form and presumably that's sort of Chinese, although it certainly went uh, underwent a lot of changes when it came to Japan. But so that gagaku flute, the ryuteki, looks basically the same way uh, from the outside. And so if you're in a uh, secondhand shop and you find a flute like this, you can recognize this as one or the two, but you kind of have to play it uh, sometimes it's a little difficult to look down and see what this extra pipe is, but somewhere along the line, uh, the no uh, people talked about how it should, um, uh, well, there, a, a change took place. I had a uh, professor at uh, Tokyo University of Fine Arts who uh, had the idea, she was a music professor. And she said, oh, her idea was that one day a flute player uh, by accident dropped his flute and broke it here. 
and then fixed it by putting this extra pipe on the inside. When he started playing, everyone said, oh, wow, that's a really interesting sound. And since the no flute doesn't have to be um, matched in pitch, the pitch of the flute has nothing to do with what the pitch of the chorus or the characters sing. And so all of that um, kind of uh, uh, is a little bit different. And so the flute is the only instrument, so-called melodic instrument, but it's very difficult to play, uh, say, a typical song in the West uh, on this kind of flute. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I hope Margaret and Mark learned uh, a lot more about uh, our fans and flute. If there's anything that you would like to add or ask, uh, I see Margaret on the screen and uh, Mark coming. If you don't, uh, then I would like to move on uh, to ask um, uh, another uh, questions. Um, it's a bit a detailed question uh, from Greg. Um, why the different pronunciation of Rari Rure Ro versus modern Japanese? Is that the way it was pronounced in the 1300s? Uh, no, it is meant to be, I mean, we generally sing, sing it. I'm not sure if you're asking for da di do de do. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it, we Romanize it oftentimes as an R, but I know some people who don't like the R sound and they'll Romanize their name as an L, but it's not an R, it's not an L, it's not a D. Uh, maybe Takahide knows some things about that. I talk about R, L, and D, and it's somewhere in between all of that. Um, or uh, some people have said it's sort of similar to something that exists in French or even Spanish, but it's more like a da di do de do. And uh, when we sing, we, we tend to sing uh, with those same um, uh, consonant sounds. Well, thank you. Good enough? <laughs> oh, I'm sure the, you, know, you, have, you have answered in good way. Um, so, I would um, like to ask Steve, Steve Pollack, um, you have a question to Richard, please. Yeah, great performance, really interesting presentation. I'm wondering, um, as you watch a no performance or as you know, people who are familiar with performances watch them, what do you look, to, look for to distinguish a, a good performance from a, a mediocre performance? Because my understanding is so much of it is really scripted and, uh, you know, kind of uh, governed by traditions lasting hundreds of years. Well, uh, that's, a, that's a good question as well. And certainly, um, you know, you can talk about tradition and how tradition has carried on uh, all these uh, many years. Uh, but, but tradition is an interesting thing. And I always say, you know, you can learn a tradition from your father and you can be very similar in many ways, but you are a different person. And over time, you and there's so many things about no where you perform with other people. And so things are different. So I see father and sons and some people will say, oh, the father was very good, but actually the son's better or, or something like that or the opposite. And the father was so good, the son never came up to the abilities. And a lot of it to me has to do with, it, with um, you know, probably the power to convince and the power to really um, kind of uh, um, communicate that. And uh, there have been actors who are considered the great actors. And I've seen a couple who were the great actors in the post-war era and some of their students. And... Uh, and see what is said about them. And uh, when you see an individual performance, I think a lot of it, to be truthful, is communicated. I mean, to me, it's communicated by a style of, or feeling of performance that um, I often, uh, that has to do with my own training. 
So in a way, that's an unfair uh, kind of um, position. Um, so I tend to understand the performance of people from my own school. And even though I see a lot of other performances, to be truthful, there are a couple of schools that I tend to not like their performances as much. Uh, there are some that I, I like other aspects of it. And uh, to be truthful, from my perspective, I see a lot of performance. And, and one of the things, and maybe this is connected to my answer from before, why I've been doing this now, uh, I, I like to say it's actually getting very close to 50 years. Um, one of the reasons is that I feel like I'm always learning something from it. And I've, I've also published some books for the National No Theater on summaries of no plays. And I tried to include all the 240 plays in the repertoires. And that's just not one school, but that's uh, across the board. No one school has that many in the repertory, but uh, that includes all of them. And so, um, you know, I learned so much just from the fact of learning about a play and sometimes wondering now, how did that play get into this repertory? It doesn't at all match some of the other kinds of plays that have gotten in. Um, but uh, so it's, it's kind of difficult in some ways to say, ah, this is a good performance um, where, you know, something else is perhaps not as good. But one more thing I'll point out is that I really look at the quality of the chorus and the quality of the instrumentalists. And I always kind of think, uh, think that you can have a kind of a younger, uh, less experienced actor or even a mediocre older actor who is really brought up very high by the ability of the chorus uh, to the side and then the uh, instrumentalists at the back. And uh, I think, you know, it's hard to be a great actor, uh, but if you have a chorus which isn't very strong or you have a uh, instrumentalist that aren't very strong, um, you're, you're not going to get up to your potential there. And so, it really is in that way, a combination. It's not one actor who determines the outcome of a performance. Everyone needs to determine that outcome. Does that kind thank of you. answer your question? I hope. Good, thank you. Thank you, Steve and Richard. Thank you very much. I think I'm afraid that uh, we have to, coming to an end of this, uh, wonderful event, uh, but I have one more question um, uh, before we uh, close. That is, uh, you've been um, spreading the no to the world in different countries and what is the, has, uh, the reaction to your ambassadorship in the no world? Uh, you know, it's, it's quite interesting because I have, and the first thing that comes to mind is how when I've taught or talked about no in many places, particularly outside of Japan, you have uh, Japanese who live in those places and they come up and say, I've never had any knowledge when I've been in Japan, I've never seen a no performance, I don't know anything about no, and this is the first time that I've been introduced to no. And so I've led various performance projects abroad. And of course, uh, when you have young people who are just involved in it and then just I'm teaching them the drum calls and there's a lot of uh, enjoyment that goes about this, this process of, you know, first trying to imitate a drum call. Yo, ho, and and uh, when I teach something like that at a university or something, then later on I've heard several times when outside of class, after it's all over, I hear students somewhere along the line trying to imitate that sound. And uh, so, uh, I mean, you know, there are many different ways that people come to it. We haven't been able to talk about costume. I only briefly introduced the masks. Um, 
you know, there are many approaches uh, to it, but uh, I think uh, even abroad there, there have been very many people who have become very interested. Another thing, I really haven't talked about the, the types of stories about it. And I mentioned the otherworldly quality because in many plays in the second half, it's the spirit of, or the ghost of a, uh, uh, of the person who appears maybe in the, in the first half. Yashima is a good example of that. And, uh, and so uh, that kind of other otherworldly quality and what that means um, as almost a, the relationship between we as people living in the present and it kind of serves as a bridge to talking to people who lived in the past. And uh, of course, it's all to the imagination of those people who created the piece, but um, it is not a so much a tragedy or a comedy. Uh, you know, Kyogen, which is often performed with no, that clearly is more of a comedy and a comedic um, sort of uh, play. But no is not a tragedy comedy kind of issue, and so it's not built uh, along those terms so much. But this kind of connection, uh, both a, a kind of religious connection. Many of the pieces are connected to Buddhism. Many of the pieces have also sort of Shinto uh, relationships or a combination of both. So um, uh, both those aspects become, um, I think, very uh, interesting about No. And uh, when I've introduced them abroad, I think people have found them to be uh, quite interesting. Well, thank you very much, Richard. I'm afraid that we have to stop Q&A session at this time. And uh, thank you very much for all those questions you asked. And I hope that you know, enjoyed um, the uh, Richard's answers. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you very much, Richard. I will just add one thing. Yes. If those who would like to see that full Funa Benke performance. Uh, like I said, you can see that online and I think it would be very good. It has English subtitles um, and you get an idea of one particular play, which is one of the most popular plays in the repertory. But there are also many, many other plays that I've seen on YouTube now and they seem to be coming, popping up even more so during uh, this COVID period. And so, uh, uh, if one wants to follow up on those, you certainly can do that. Thank you very much, um, Richard, again. I think this has been a wonderful time to learn and become familiar with No. Uh, and I think we have learned uh, many of the secrets or mysteries why No has survived, been popular over 600 years in Japan, and now it's spreading to many parts of the world. Um, we also enjoyed your you know, uh, personal uh, demonstrations very much. Um, thank you very much. I sincerely hope that uh, your global journey as no ambassador to spread no will continue well to all parts of the world. And I, uh, please uh, join me uh, giving big hands to Richard. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. <laughs> thank you. And Japan Society of Northern California is a uh, this year, 116 years old nonprofit organization committed to advance understanding and friendship uh, between the people of the US and Japan. And for that purpose, we provide many interesting uh, programs in a variety of interests, such as arts and culture, like today's event, history policy, international relations, business and technology and innovation and so on, and so many wide, uh, wide range of activities. But these activities programs have been made possible by general uh, support of many corporate members and sponsors, as well as individual uh, supporters. Taking this opportunity, I would like to um, thank uh, those corporate members, as I hope you are seeing on the screen, and the individual members as well. Particularly, I would like to thank MUFG Union Bank as our strategic partner and other Yokozuna members. Thank you very much. And I also like to thank today's participants for your generous donations. It means a lot to us. Thank you very much. 
We have an interesting event lined up for March uh, that includes discussion on corporate bo board diversity on March 4th, how Japan's female board members can drive board diversity in Japan, and an event to commem commemorate the 10th anniversary of the Great East Japan earthquake on March 8th by looking at increasingly sophisticated technology tools for natural uh, disaster prevention and the reduction of damages. Uh, others, other programs are coming up. Please uh, look for emails from us about those events. We'll be sending an event survey in the next few days and please take a moment uh, to respond. It's a very simple so survey. So please let us know your opinion. With that, uh, I'd like to close today, today's event. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you again, Richard. Um, have a wonderful evening and uh, or a wonderful day for those in Japan. Thank you very much. See you again soon.